Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Kalfas again. I should say Happy Easter to everybody as well. Thank you for coming to our talk. And um, I'll be speaking to you about microphone. microphone yes, microphone over there. Fine. Fine. I'll be speaking to you about um, training safer trauma surgeons in the 21st century. So, I'm a research fellow and a surgical trainee at Imperial College London, and that's my supervisor, Mr. Gupti who will be giving a talk to you um, about training surgeons from a consultant's perspective. Um, and we want to talk about how we can maintain patient safety in orthopedic surgery. So our workplace is a little different from the office. We tend to deal with broken bones, ruptured muscles, high velocity injuries, anything can come through the door. So you have to be ready to work under pressure and to be ready to deal with any complications um, as a result of injury. Trauma itself, or otherwise known as injury, um, it's a big global burden of disease. It's actually the third biggest one, according to the World Health Organization. Um, it, costs the, it costs the NHS half a billion pounds a year, and it costs our society about three billion pounds in economic loss um, annually. So we need to be able to deal with trauma very effectively so that we can restore the function of our patients as quickly as possible so that they can return to their normal activity and daily routine and have a good rate of recovery. Um, for every surgeon, the priority is always patient safety, patient satisfaction, making sure you're safe as a surgeon. But we do have a few problems nowadays with the training program. Compared to my predecessors and my bosses, I'm meant to reach the same level of training and competency and confidence as they are in 80% less dedicated time in the operating theatre. So from 30,000 hours to 6,000 hours. And this is all because of the um, European working time regulations which were introduced um, at the turn of the century. So that's going to be a problem. There are other problems in the system as well, which I've highlighted over here. What we need to do is to figure out a way where I can learn to be a safe surgeon to provide my patients with the optimal health care, best results, while still complying with the uh, working regulations um, without causing any uh, extra damage or trauma to my patients as well. So, this is what my research is about with Mr. Gupti, and we've been trying to think of ways so that we can train safer trauma surgeons uh, for the future. It's not just only us. We belong to the MSK lab at Charing Cross Hospital, um, which is on the <coughs> Imperial College London, and together we are a multidisciplinary uh, team of people who collaborate, sit down, and we think to ourselves, what can we do to improve the quality of education and its delivery? And can we find more innovative ways of teaching surgeons in the 21st century um, rather than just depending on textbooks? No matter how much um, I read off the internet, no matter how many textbooks I read, in the amount of time I'm meant to become a competent surgeon, um, there are only some things you can learn from textbooks. I need to find another way to become as technically good as my predecessors. So together as a family, we try to find um, innovative ways. So I'll be telling you about what we've done and the research behind it. So we sat down to us and we thought to ourselves, what does it take to be a good surgeon? What are the qualities of a surgeon that we all look for? And we came up with a few things. We need a surgeon to be a good leader, but also a good uh, team player, somebody who can communicate very effectively. Somebody who's good with their hands, manual dexterity. Somebody who can think under pressure, somebody who can cope under pressure and with failure as well. And those things are quite difficult to learn from textbooks, I'm sure you'll agree. So what can we do to uh, practice, practice these skills? The first thing we did is we acquired the first ever virtual reality simulators on the market for orthopedic surgery. This has been very effective in general surgery and abdominal surgery, but nothing has been done in orthopedic surgery. So on the left-hand side, we um, can teach our medical students how to repair fractured hips, which is the commonest orthopedic traumatic operation that people will do. And on the right, 
we'll practice how to do keyhole surgery, so minimally invasive surgery for the knee, for example. Um, hopefully the video will work. Got a video to show you. Um, so these two simulators for the first time on the continent have now been integrated within our um, training programs. And what we're trying to do is teach medical students, junior trainees like myself, even middle grade trainees, on how to do certain orthopedic operations, which are very common in the NHS, safely. The solution we thought to training safer surgeons was through simulation. What is simulation? Simulation is the recreation of a clinical scenario like this operation in a controlled environment away from patients where one can learn new skills, practice them, develop them, and also perfect them before you can do them on patients, hence increasing patient safety. The good thing about these machines is a lot of people have asked me in the exhibition, how realistic are they? Well, they look pretty real, they feel pretty real, and how do they feel pretty real? It's because when you touch either the bone or the tendons or the ligaments, the machine itself won't allow you to go through them, you'll actually feel force feedback, and we call that haptic technology. So we've done pretty well with that. Now, I know that I'm sitting in a room full of people uh, who are esteemed scientists and researchers. Um, and what we tend to ask ourselves is, how do you know anything works? We need evidence, we need to do research for it. So the, your next question to me will be, well, how do you know this works, Cattle? Good question, the answer. We did a study, a randomized controlled trial, where we took medical students who are naive to orthopedic surgery, have never had any uh, operative experience, um, and haven't had any um, exposure to a virtual reality machine. And so we asked them to do an operation 10 times to repair fractured hips, the very, the very common operation. What we see is in less than 10 attempts, these medical students demonstrate a training effect. They improve in their time, in their accuracy, in their confidence levels and the scores in general. We had 17 objective uh, performance metrics that we can measure with a virtual reality machine and they've all been validated. And so this machine works, we have the evidence behind it. The level that we are aiming for is consultancy. The consultants are the bosses of the department. And as demonstrated, as demonstrated over here, the consultants' efforts are outlined in black dots. And as you can see, in even less than seven attempts, those medical students are reaching the same level as the consultants using this simulator. So there is a training effect. With more training, with more practice, otherwise simulation doesn't work, you will gain your competency, practice your skills, and again, improve your manual dexterity, your decision-making process, and become a safer surgeon before you do it on patients. The next thing is decision-making as a surgeon is quite important. As you can imagine, these patients who have suffered severe trauma, severe injury. It's a bit of hit and miss. Um, they can be quite unstable, and there's a risk of mortality in these patients. Unfortunately, because of the lack of exposure to major trauma incidents, a lot of the junior doctors find it difficult to decide what to do next for the patient's best interest. Because out of practice, out of, you know, you may not know what to do next. So we need to practice that. Now we can't <coughs> practice that in the emergency department because then you're risking patient safety. So we found another way of doing so. We try to use telepresence, virtual reality and second life platforms to run a scenario, a realistic scenario, where both medical students, junior, middle grade and senior orthopedic surgeons had to make very tough decisions uh, throughout the process in order to resuscitate the patient and make sure um, he or she was stable. So here's just a trial. We have a, a gentleman here who's 55, who's had a road traffic accident, and as you can see, he's got a broken leg on the right side. Um, eventually you'll be able to see um, it in, in close-up as well. 
somebody who's got a major trauma, somebody who has broken their leg, and sorry for the, the gory scenes, um, somebody who's broken their leg, they bleed quite a lot, and if they bleed quite a lot, then you have to be careful about their blood pressure, their heart rate. These people need to be <coughs> managed very aggressively and correctly, otherwise you'll be hurting them even more. Okay? And as you can see, we ask people about everything. What blood test would you do? What would you do next? How do you read an EKG or an ECG? Would you take a patient to theatre? Why would you? Why wouldn't you? What imaging would you do? So all these decision-making processes that every doctor ought to know about but doesn't have the opportunity to practice on is something that we can now do through telepresence. We want to roll this out um, on an international scale uh, at the end of the year um, and also give it to developing countries who actually have more internet access than, than you can appreciate, but maybe not as many textbooks. Recently, we founded the Hamlet Group. We wanted to find a way to teach orthopedic surgeons and medical students a new way of learning operative steps for the common orthopedic operation. The gold standard nowadays is getting a textbook, an encyclopedia of orthopedic surgery, and just going into it page by page. These are line diagrams. They may not even have pictures in them. You need to also remember that orthopedic surgeons and medical students and you know, people who decide to do medicine are quite visually uh, stimulated people. They like, to un uh, they like to learn and understand through the visual medium. So then we thought, could we use another medium to teach them how to do orthopedic surgery? So that's what we did. We used holographic technology for the first time, brought into electro theater, using three projectors, superimposed <coughs> all the images, Compared to the static PowerPoint presentations that medical students and doctors spend thousands of hours year after year attending, you can imagine that after so many slides and after so many words, it all becomes a big blur. With this one, we didn't count too much on words as much as a visual medium. Here we used holograms to uh, teach about medicine and surgery. And then we thought, will this improve their ability to understand how to do a procedure? We did one for orthopedics. Over here, we've talked about anatomy, physiology, surgery, pathology, when things go wrong, microbiology. We can emulate it in any topic whatsoever. And again, this has not been done in any university media. It doesn't have to, do f it doesn't have to only be for medicine. It can be for any academic discipline whatsoever. We're currently working with Brazil and the Brazilian government in a bit to try to um, introduce this into their curriculum as well. Your next question is to me, Kapil, how do you know if this works? What if people prefer PowerPoint presentations rather than this? Can this have the potential to replace the gold, um, the gold standard of PowerPoint? And the question is, yes, we did, an, we did research on it. And this is what we found. Um, before we go on to that, I wanted to show you that we received a lot of um, international press um, and attention for the technology that we provide, simply because a lot of the people from abroad <coughs> also felt that this was potentially the new gold standard. And so the research here suggests that people who have a greater visual spatial awareness, people who understand better through the visual medium as are under the dashed lines at the bottom, blue being holograms, red being PowerPoint. Their scores, giving them the same test to PowerPoint and the same test to a holographic lecture, they scored 17.5% more using the holographic medium than PowerPoint. So we've now demonstrated that holograms could actually be the future of didactic teaching, like this lecture, for example. The whole point of surgery is to work with your hands. It's a satisfaction of, a, of an immediate uh, treatment when you fix something yourself. And so how can we then teach our medical students, our junior doctors, on how to perform an operation away from patients? How can they practice a skill like that? So this is what we did. We want to teach them how to nail a structure in, in a leg. 
we inflated our own, uh, our own inflatable theater in our own lab, so away from the patients. We then used real theater equipment. This is what we use when we want to do this operation. We use artificial models using bone fractures and um, musculature. We then used um, a group of people. We had anesthetists, scrub nurses, and the participating surgeon on the right practicing this operation, again, in a safe environment away from the patients to enhance their technical skills. And they did very well. So what does the future hold for teaching surgery through, simu through simulation? In the right uh, top-hand corner, we have the Acrobot, and I just want to speak a minute about it. So the Acrobot is um, a medium of robotic surgery where you can implant hip and knee implants to zero degree precision. So the shelf life is also uh, increased because the shelf life of any implantation in orthopedics is usually, you know, depending on how well you do it, anywhere between 10 to 15 years. But if you do it very well, um, then that can also be um, increase before you need it to have revision surgery. In the top, sorry, in the bottom uh, left, we have the uh, 3D printer. Uh, we have acquired two 3D printers at AMSK lab where we can actually uh, print models of the fractures of our patients. And that's really helpful. Um, rather than looking at an X-ray, a CT, an MRI, um, you can actually have a 3D model of somebody's pelvis with a fracture. You can look at it, you can study it. You can actually anticipate any problems you may have when you go and operate on that patient. It helps you with the surgical guidance. In the top right, um, we have a one-size-fits-all policy when we want to do, uh, when we want to replace joints. But that's not the case. Everybody is uh, born differently and, and, and have their own uh, different morphological um, uh, key features. So we can also use patient-matched implants, and that's happening at the MSK lab as well. And then finally, as part of clinical governance, Patient satisfaction, like I mentioned to you, is a priority for any surgeon, especially in orthopedic surgery. And so we wanted to see if we can increase patient satisfaction using visual models in our consultations to see if they understood what was wrong with their joints, what operation they needed. And luckily, that's also been proven quite successful. And towards the end here. Um, so this is what we're doing to improve the quality of education, the delivery of teaching for the future trauma uh, and orthopedic surgeons in the 21st century. And I just want to leave you with one thought. After my talk, I hope that as patients, and we're all patients on the NHS, I hope you feel safer knowing that we're doing everything we can to train surgeons more safely um, in a control setting rather than on you, Thank you very much.